Hey everyone, it's me, Arthur Cade. Sugar Sammy. First of all, I want to start with a million dollar question. What is the sugar? The sugar is, it's a name I got um, when I was in uh, McGill University. I used to throw parties to pay my tuition fees, and I used to invite all the girls, take care of them at the clubs, and then they'd call me Sugar Sammy, and then it just stuck. And now I'm, uh, now I have that name forever. I used to, all these people used to come to my parties, started coming to my shows when I would do stand-up full-time, and everybody was like, oh, what's this good-looking crowd doing at this, <laughs> at this comedy show in these little comedy clubs? And so the name stuck. Okay, I want to actually go party with you in Toronto now. Let's Forget do the, this. We do the Toronto Film Festival every year. I'm like, am I, are you the guy to call when I'm no, in Toronto? The best parties are in Montreal, so you call me when you're in Montreal. Interview's over. We're going, we're going to Montreal. We're going to Montreal. I was watching all your stuff, man. You have had such tremendous success in Canada, and now you're moving to the U.S. You've got a whole big U.S. tour. Mm -hmm. Talk to me about that transition and, and being able to have this, this uh, tour in the U.S. Uh, I think it's fun. I haven't toured in the U.S. in six years. And I thought, you know, the best time to come to the U.S. is when Donald Trump is president. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Just makes comedy so easy. Like, if I get past the border, it'll be fine. Um, so, no, it was... Uh, yeah, uh, it's just fantastic. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, I'm a little bit nervous because it's my first time in the U.S. in six years. So I'm like, you know, have I evolved in terms of comedy to catch up with uh, everything that's going on here? But I think so. I mean, I've been uh, I've been performing in France, been performing in Canada, performing all over the world. So I'm going to bring my unique point of view to the U.S. and probably uh, probably do uh, do I think do pretty well over here. I'm going to end my tour at Caroline's over here in New York. So it's going to be great. The mecca of comedy. I know how, the mecca of comedy. How exciting is that when you get to I mean, you haven't done it yet, but to think that I'm going to be where people like Jerry Seinfeld, Chris Rock, and the legends of all legends have performed. It's got to be crazy. It's amazing. It's amazing. It's, uh, it's going to be... Uh it's going to be fun to uh, to do it. And I know already I've been running into Canadians here, Quebecers, people from Montreal who are like, are you performing? I'm like, I'm at Caroline's. They're already gathering groups to come out and see me here in New York. When you have this type of success in Canada and you have this fan base, what is it like to have that type of success in your home country? It's got to be just, I'm imagining, mind-blowing where everybody, I mean, you have... You blew the doors off with everything you do over there. Yeah, I mean, it feels good. I don't feel a success because I'm always working, you know? I'm always working. I'm Are always you in, in a bubble. bubble because I'm always into that, in, in that bubble. Plus, whenever I hang out with my parents, which is a lot, <laughs> they don't make me feel like I'm, I'm successful at all. Because my parents don't drive, so they're always like, okay, let's go do the groceries. <laughs> so we go do the groceries. I take my parents. And, you know, people know who I am. And my parents, you know, we're, we're a very soft drink. Uh, we call it, You guys call it pop drinking family. Yep. So, you know, my parents wait to take the recycling when I drive them to, uh, to, uh, to the grocery store. So they'll be like, we'll start the groceries. You go put the cans in the machine. You know, the, the, the recycling <laughs> machine that gives you that little ticket. So people see me with two big garbage bags of cans putting these cans in these machines and they're like, is that Sugar Sammy? <laughs> he, he needs a new agent. <laughs> so I never feel the success. When's the moment, obviously you're doing the club promoting thing, but when's the moment that you start thinking to yourself, this could be a career. People may pay to see me tell jokes. Uh, you never think that. No, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> uh, I think it just started happening organically. You know, like uh, in the beginning, I was always, I always had my foot in comedy and then I was doing something else. But then uh, it just, it's one of those transitions that happens naturally where people are like, okay, we're, we're going to come and see. Sometimes I, I feel like, and it's very Canadian to go, well, people pay that much to come and see me, really? $20, <laughs> you know? And then it just grows and grows and grows and you feel like you get a fan base, your theaters get bigger, your, you know, your, uh, the venues get bigger, the promotion gets bigger, and then uh, it's, a, it's a natural thing. But it's, it's fun at any stage. I mean, you know, just performing at a comedy club or an open mic and trying new stuff out is just as exciting sometimes as doing a big theater. How much does your ethnicity play into your comedy? How much are you able to use it? Uh, I use it a little bit, but I don't overdo it. Like, I'll use it enough to, when I talk about my parents, they're obviously Indian, so I'm not going to hide that. And, I, and I, when I go back home to India, I'll talk about that. But I don't just... Uh, focus on that like I like talking about everything else my favorite thing is to come into a country or a culture and observe and then report back you know <laughs> like, I like doing like that a, about the like states a daily as well. show correspondent yeah exactly I, I mean I, but I'm gonna do that here as well I'm gonna do that in the states I think it's it, it's fun to observe the differences between you know can, uh, Canadians and Americans and and Americans and the French and like you know just being in all of these different countries it's gonna give me such a, a such such a rich gold mine to talk about we're seeing an explosion of minorities in comedy right now. In fact, the White House Correspondents Dinner was just hosted by a brilliant young comedian who's on The Daily Show, Hassan Minaj. Mm -hmm. 
When you see people like Aziz Ansari, who we are, don't call it minorities anymore. That's offensive. No, I'm kidding. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we call us the colored. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> but it's got to be exciting to see what's happening in comedy right now. I mean, I'm, uh, Aziz Ansari, hit show. You see Hassan killing it at the White House yeah. Correspondence Center. Ali Wong. Ali Wong, who's like the next... Yeah. fresh voice out there I, th I think when you when you watch a lot of that you see different point of view points of view and that's so interesting because like you don't want your comedy landscape to be you know uh you know uniform you want it to have different points of view and and diversity because it makes it more interesting for the viewer as well it makes it more interesting for the comedy consumer because most people who watch comedy who buy comedy tickets don't just go to one show a year they'll go to a few and it's fun to have that, uh, that diversity out there. And it's cool to have people not only from different ethnic backgrounds, but from different countries. You guys are, are you know, have a lot of these Canadians and South Africans. Yep. And, Trevor and, Noah. Yeah, Trevor Noah. You got people, you know, from England who are here. You got John Oliver. Like, so you've got these points of view that are coming. James Corden, you know, so, uh, so I, th I think that makes America more interesting. It's making America great again. <laughs> Speaking of making America great again, what do the Canadians think about what's going on over here? Uh, we, we, we love it, man. I'm telling you, I, uh, I love Donald Trump. Not as president, as entertainment. As entertainment. Like, we've canceled Netflix in Canada. Like, Netflix went bankrupt. We just watch you guys now. <laughs> so it's a comedy goldmine for us. It's, uh, it's, fun, it's, it's fun to watch from afar, but I, I'm, I'm going to be curious to, 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 be, uh, to tour and, and, and see what's going on. Because I'm sure every, from state to state, opinions are going to defer you know it's going to be such a different vibe from texas to florida to seattle washington to new york city like so i'm going to get a, a pretty honest sample of what's going on in america i was just reading this great article in rolling stone about chris rock mm -hmm. and he's on in his enormous total blackout tour and he was talking about how depending on the location he will vary his act him and his managers will determine what jokes they want to <laughs> Do you vary your act when you're at certain places versus others? Listen, we'll see. I haven't, <laughs> I haven't, I haven't started my tour. Depends on the, the death. But have you historically? Like, have you um, thought, okay, this joke may land here, but wouldn't land here? No, I, I usually keep my act pretty. Uh, I mean, I do, but it's not because I don't want to. I'm, I'm afraid that it'll offend. I, I never adjust because I think it's offensive or not. I'll adjust because I'll think, oh, culturally, that's not a reference point to them. Like, if I talk about. I have a joke about a French celebrity in France that I talk about. I can't do that joke here because they won't know who I'm talking about, you know, because you need to instantaneously with that material, you need to know who that person is, have a visual of them. And if the Americans don't know, then I'll skip that joke just because work. it doesn't work culturally. Right. But not because I'm like, oh, this might offend people. I actually, I think I actually pretty much love offending. <laughs> yeah, well, that was one of the things I noticed with your with your stuff is you play with the audience, mm -hmm. which I love because a lot of times you'll see comedians who they're in the moment of their routine, but they're showmen. Mm -hmm. You really are making it almost like an interactive show and ripping on the audience, which I think is just great. Yeah, I love that. I mean, you know, some of my my biggest influences, I think, uh, do that. And I, for me, I grew up in the Canadian uh, comedy world and I toured a lot in England and there you've got to do crowd work because the crowds will heckle you especially in England <laughs> England they come to fight man so if you're not ready with a response like this they're gonna be like vultures vultures they'll eat you up I've seen comedians come in not be ready for that and just get eaten alive in England so it makes you tougher when you when you do England Northern Ireland I think was probably the toughest gig I've ever done they're tough man those they're people tough. are tough listen those people yeah <laughs> speaking those of offensive people. those people those <laughs> they, Northern Irish the, Nor the Northern Irish are tough when I went to perform there I was at this club they didn't even have seats the dudes were just standing I came out and they're like they had beers in their hand they were hammered and they were yelling out in the middle of premises, they were cutting me off, and I had to do an hour, and I fulfilled the hours, the longest show I've ever done. I thought they wanted to fight me. <laughs> I, I got off stage, and I was like, man, that was tough. And the manager goes, that was one of the best gigs we've ever had. And I'm like, he's like, you finished. Most comedians don't finish that gig. How much of that is improv, and how much of that is you have a stable of comments that you can go to that 
you've already faced certain situations and you know you can pull out of your little magic bag? Uh, a lot of it is improv, but every time I come up with something good in a situation, I'll be like, oh, I'll hold this and put this in my toolbox for next time this happens. So I'll have a toolbox that's pretty full. I've been doing this for 22 years. So if something happens, I'll have responses ready, but sometimes things happen out of nowhere, you know, and, uh, and things that have never happened before. So you've got to be, you've got to think of the quickest way to make that crowd go crazy out of, uh, out of whatever happens in the, in the audience. And then you hold it on for your toolbox and, and, uh, and do it next time somebody says anything. 22 years, by the way, comedy has changed so much. Mm -hmm. if you, so if we're in 2017, I think, yeah, 2017, <laughs> that means we're going back to 1995. 1995, that's right. There was, I don't even think internet in 1995, and now you have people who are building careers. <laughs> there was off barely Snapchat. internet. There was, bare, there was yeah. like the dial-up yeah. stuff where yeah. you're like 10 minutes just to get online. Yeah. And you get, you've got mail, remember? Right. And you get excited about the mail that you were, you're getting or, and then MySpace, but now it's like people are building comedy routines on 10 second snapchat videos it's true how do you stay relevant through that 22 years because you have to yeah i think you just gotta because things will change you know like, there'll be that next app which will be like you got to do something for a second <laughs> you know you just got to be good at what you do on stage that's what people come out and see you know if you're good on stage and you just keep doing what you do and you craft it technically in a uh in a professional manner, I think everything else falls into place. And then, you know, you got to try to do everything around it, the social media stuff. But I think the, um, you know, the, the, the gist of your career has got to be how good you are on stage. You got to focus on what's uh, on the big picture. When do you know something's funny? I've always wondered this is uh, for comedians. It's like you, you're in your little hole, you're observing the world, you're putting jokes together. Mm -hmm. But how do you know, okay, this is going to work in my show? Um, a lot of it is just instinct, like something will happen and you just go, I got to write that down and you'll know in an instant that the, th you know, the theme is funny or, or something around it is funny. And then you try it out on stage. It's the only way to know, the only way to know it's so democratic, man. You know, how they say, uh, in showbiz, you're as good as your last show yep. in comedy. You're as good as your last joke. You could be up there killing for 20 minutes and then one or two bits down, down that, uh, set something could go wrong and you might lose the crowd for the rest of the show. So you'll know as soon as you start working on it and you bring it up in front of an audience, whether it works or not, how good that joke is. And then you, you got to change it, tweak it or get rid of it. Is there anything better? It's, it's, kind of, it's like sex. When you have that, that show where you just feel the audience, that whole half hour, that whole hour, and you've just knocked it out of the park. Is there any better feeling than that? No, it's better than sex. It is, isn't it? Is it is better than sex. It's like you're having sex with like 1,400 people <laughs> at the same time. Well, he is Sugar Sammy. Yeah, and they're all coming at the same time. Um, so, so no, it, it's better than sex being up there. And uh, some women get mad at that when you say that. No, but listen, anytime, it's not better than for sex. anybody who does what we do, and I'm not a comedian, but just doing this, when you have those interviews where you're locked in and you know that the engagement was there and you're in the moment, and you're like, nobody could have done that potentially better, yeah. which happens for me one every, one every 2,000, but no, um, <laughs> but it is, it, it's the greatest feeling in the world. Yeah. So I always wonder for a comedian, when you have that killer show, what is it like? Yeah, it's amazing. It's, it's the best feeling in the world. I think whenever um, I'm not on stage for a couple of weeks, like when I'm on vacation and stuff, I really start getting antsy, you know, or uh, I feel like when I'm on, uh, you know, I'll have typically four to six shows a week. So the days I'm not on stage, I'm a little more depressed in the days I am on stage. So I know how that, you feel. Yeah, so that's that's when you know you love what you're doing, you know? Who are your influences? Who do you look up to? Uh, I think growing up, Eddie Murphy. The best. Eddie Murphy the for best. me, Delirious and Raw, I think were... The two greatest shows of all time. Two greatest shows of all time. I remember being a kid, asking my mom to rent that tape for me, you know? For all the kids watching out there, a tape <laughs> is... Uh, Okay. <laughs> What's mind blowing to me is when you talk to that the millennial generation and they have no idea. Eddie, they think of Eddie Murphy as Doctor Doolittle. Yeah, I know. And it's like no, Eddie Murphy was the funniest guy on the planet for a solid decade, at least. Yeah. yeah, and I feel like you have to look at someone's body of work, and if you look at the body of work that Eddie Murphy brought, I mean, it's anybody would be envious of that career. And uh, Delirious and Raw for me were definite. Uh, staples. I mean, I look at other guys today that I love. Dave Chappelle, Chris Rock. Uh, you look at Bill Burr, who's amazing. Dave so the, right. Yeah, so these guys, I think, uh, for me, have always been uh, great. And also, you know, British influences. Uh, Sasha Baron Cohen, uh, Ricky Gervais, like all of these guys. I like that comedy that pushes far, that's honest, that's unfiltered. For me, that's always been 
my favorite type of comedy to watch. And it's the type of comedy I like doing as well. I know you're doing Caroline's, but you also have some other tour stops that we're going to have this up before then. So where are you going to be? Okay, I start off in San Jose, then Seattle. Then I go to uh, Houston, Austin, Atlanta, Naples, Florida, and then I end at Caroline's right here uh, in New York City. That'll be my last stop on this leg of the tour, but I'll be back in the States. Everybody make sure to check out Sugar Sammy on tour. And if you're in Montreal, hit them up. <laughs> <laughs>